I just want to say that I am not up here as the founder of Project Salam. I'm up here as a member of a committee, a group of people down in Albany that got together and uh, were inspired to do something about the grave injustice that we saw. And everybody in this committee has contributed different pieces to it to make it work. And I want to emphasize that fact because, as you've heard from all the prior speakers, community is really essential to this kind of work. We have to be uh, able to, uh, it, it's not just a solo act, it is an act in which we share and we build and we support each other. And I particularly wanted to point out Kathy Manley, who is the lawyer who, who provides the legal brains to this thing. Um, Lynn Jackson, uh, Octave the Pinewood's great activist, uh, Jean Finley. We don't publish anything without her going over it and, and telling us where we're wrong. Uh, we have Shumshad Ahmad from the Muslim community who has been uh, just terrific in his support. Uh, Marwa L. Bailey, uh, a young activist. Uh, and we have Ellie Bernstein who's contributed, Dave Capone, Michael Rice. And I could go on. There's a lot of people who are here and a lot of people who are not here. And uh, so I just want to pay a little bit of, uh, make sure that everybody understands, I'm simply speaking for them. And when I talk about my journey, I started out as the uh, chief attorney for the Commission on Judicial Conduct in Albany. I retired in 2003. We were disciplining bad judges. And so it gave me a look at the judicial system, perhaps from the ground of a worm's eye view of it. Uh, when I retired in 2003, um, my wife decided that I wasn't busy enough and <laughs> persuaded me to go to a to an event that was uh, happening down at the library. And as a result of that, um, I became involved in the uh, terrorism trial of Yassin Araf and Mohammed Hussein in Albany. Uh, these were the local imam who had been uh, charged with terrorism. And uh, Kathy's firm, the Kinlan firm, was representing uh, him. And Kathy and I both worked on this case together. My assignment was basically to go down to the jail and spend time with Yassin and, and talk to him and uh, try to find out any information that would be helpful for the defense. So I spent a lot of time with him. I spent you know, eight, 10 hours a week sometimes just, just letting him talk because he really needed to talk. He was in solitary at the time. And I remember particularly his constant refrain, look at the evidence. Tell me where I said or did anything wrong. Tell me where it was. If you can find anything that I said that, or did that was wrong, I will plead guilty and demand the death penalty. <laughs> and I have to say, after many years of trying to find this, I have not been able to find anything that he said or did that was wrong. And yet he was convicted. Uh, a lot of manipulation from the U.S. Attorney's Office and the government. And it came as, I think, a shock to Kathy and I both that this could happen. This was, to us, a clear injustice. And so we have pondered considerably over the years as to just what caused this injustice. One of the things we discovered was that there was similar injustices going on all over the country. Uh, up in Syracuse, there was the Rafael Dafir. Uh, down in New York City, there was Bahad Hashmi. Down in Florida, there was Sammy Alarian, and so on ago. Down in Texas, there was Kassan Alashi and the Holy Land Five. And I could start to rattle off cases. And so we founded uh, Project Salam, Kathy and I, and, and uh, Lynn and Shamsha and some others, uh, to try to document all of these cases of injustice that had gone on and try to find the, the, the common pattern. What was there about these cases uh, that made them the way they were? Because they all sort of presented differently. And what we began to realize, what came out of it, was that these were cases that had been tainted in a way by war. We like to think of, the, of our judicial system as a universal set of principles that apply equally to everybody. But when we go to war, we name an enemy. We pick out an enemy. It may be a foreign enemy. Maybe we send foreign troops over there to fight it. But there's a, an end to this, a domestic side to that. And we take that domestic side and we name the domestic enemy. And then we are given permission to treat them differently, to profile them, to discriminate against them or to even hold them collectively responsible for what the group did. And so we began to realize that there's essentially two parallel systems of justice operating. If you were non-Muslim, uh, you were treated in one way. If you were Muslim, you were treated in a different way. And we began to give a name to that. We called it preemptive prosecution. It sort of mirrored the idea that the government, that 
when we feel threatened, we can go and attack somebody first before they attack us. Uh, and so if somebody gives us suspicion in this country, the tail end of the domestic side of that would be, if somebody gives suspicion to us, we can go and take them down in the criminal justice system, lock them up on phony pretext charges to preempt them from giving us these uncomfortable feelings that they might do something. Uh, so that was what preemptive prosecution was about. We looked at uh, Yassine's case as a classic example of preemptive prosecution. Um, and one of the gifts that we're, we were given in that case was that after he was sent away for 15 years, and his co-defendant was sent away for 15 years, um, they left families. Yassine had a family of four young children, and the co-defendant had a family of six young children. Uh, the co-defendant had a heroic wife trying to hold everything together. And Yassine left a wife who was so traumatized that she was almost unable to function. And at some level, our group decided that one of the things we could do for this, in this case of injustice, was to support the family. And it proved to be a great blessing. If the, if the whole community had been destroyed, we probably would have been overwhelmed with a burden. It would have been too difficult. But we had two families, 10 children. And if, if one of the um, mother's wives had, if all the wives had been functional, it probably would have been too easy. But it wasn't. One of the great gifts we got was that one of the wives, mothers, was truly incapable. Mm. And so we became aunties and uncles to a large family and had to try to raise them or bring them up or make, help make decisions for the family in an Islamic way. And it was a great exercise for us. Um, certain decisions that I would have made that seemed absolutely obvious to us were not obvious to them. And we, we clashed over it, we struggled with it, but as time went on, we became much more sensitive, I think, to how the Muslim community saw what was happening to them. And they became more sensitive to what we were trying to do. They realized that we were imperfect. We were not getting things right. We were missing cues. We were doing all sorts of things wrong, but we were trying. And they appreciated it. And so now, as in my job as executive director of the National Coalition, I go around and I to different places all over the country because that basically we were trying to end preemptive prosecution all over the country. And I go into mosques and places and I give talks about preemptive prosecution and what is going wrong. And I know now a little bit about the Islamic community enough to be able to make a speech there. But very often I have people that will come up and say, look, Steve's a good guy. He's trying to help. He's not saying it quite right. The Prophet Muhammad said, and then we'll go into his beautiful thing. And everybody will go, oh, what he's saying is actually an Islamic value. It's just that he's expressing it in civil rights terms. Oh, OK, now we get it. You know, this is, this is fine. But there's a translation that has to go on. And that was one of the really good things. And I want to refer to that later on when I, I come down to it. Uh, the, the point I want to really make, however, in the, in the beginning at least, is that we became aware of these two legal systems. The system where it applies equally to everybody, and the system where we say, you're the enemy. This is an enemy group over here. We get to treat them differently. And I think the best example of that was the internment of the Japanese during World War II. You can all agree, uh, the Fred Korematsu brought in this challenge, went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld the rule, said that was OK. We agree that this is a burden on the Constitution. This violates all of our legal principles. It is, it is offensive. But there is a secret government report that says that the Japanese are a security threat. And hey, if they're a security threat, security comes first. Now, there's an interesting footnote to this case. And I want to mention it because I think it's really relevant to what's happening today. <laughs> Kathy's nodding there. <laughs> really relevant. A number of years later, some researchers went back in and they found a report that the Solicitor General had cited to the Supreme Court. And this, the uh, report, indeed, was about the security threat of the Japanese. And it said that the Japanese were not a security threat. Hmm. Solicitor General had simply all-facedly lied to the Supreme Court. Hmm. And on the basis of that lie, Fred Korematsu's conviction was reversed. And he was eventually given the Medal of Freedom. 
And it's a, a, a nice feel-good story about Fred Korematsu and the Japanese community, but it is also a reminder that in times of war, truth is the first casualty. And the government will lie about it. And it's also a reminder that in time of war, if you want to get something done, classify it. Then you can say anything you want to about it. Nobody can disagree with you. So this was a model that was created. And it has come down to us. Uh, and I just want to briefly trace the history of, of how some of this has come down to us. In this country, we have uh, probably four traditional enemy groups. One would be the Native Americans. One would be African Americans. One would be immigrants and particularly the Latinos recently. And uh, finally would be the communists and other assorted leftists. And as to of these groups, there is a kind of common understanding that they are in some respect, in some way, other. They are not necessarily bound by the same universal rules of justice that the rest of us are uh, bound by or, or protected by. And that is, we can hold a certain amount of collective guilt, and we can treat them in, in certain ways that are contrary to the Constitution. And I think perhaps the best example, that I, I'm, I'm trying to move fast here so I, I, we leave some time for questions, was the COINTELPRO period. How many people here remember COINTELPRO? OK, I don't have to explain this at any length. But it was a time when both the, the, American, the Native Americans, the African Americans, uh, the Latinos and also the uh, communists, or not the communists, but the leftists because the protesters in Vietnam all kind of came together. Do you all remember that time? It was a time when these different communities were kind of struggling to talk to each other and to find out that they were all basically fa facing the same kind of repressive government. And I, I still remember the, 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 uh, the Black Panthers kind of standing there trying to have a conversation with the hippies that are pro-war or anti-war, and the, the strange kind of translations that had to take place in order for these two groups to understand each other and to say, wait a minute, we look differently, we act differently, but the common enemy is the government that's repressing both of us. And the government fought back against that. They perceived that this was war. And they came up with a program called COINTELPRO, which was designed to uh, suppress and uh, and, and attack and, and basically control all these four groups. If you talk to a peace group like this, they will remember COINTELPRO one way. They will remember it as the disruption of the marches and the, uh, all of the various things that happened as they were protesting uh, COINTELPRO, uh, uh, Vietnam. If you talk to the Black Panthers or, or African Americans today, they will remember it in quite a different way. They will remember the targeted assassinations, the false charges, the uh, paranoia when the, the FBI was, was hunting them, and continues to some extent to hunt them today. So the government was um, attacking these different communities in different ways, but there was a common theme behind it, which was we are at war. We do not have to <coughs> give these groups the same rights that other groups are given. And that was one of the findings of the uh, church committee when it came out, it was essentially that the government had declared war on its own citizens. And they said that is completely unacceptable in a democracy. It can never happen again. As it turned out, Hotel Pro was revealed by a group of activists that went in, burglarized an FBI office, and came up with the files and distributed them to the press, who promptly publicized them. And within months, Hoover saw the handwriting on the wall and officially shut the program down. Did it actually shut down? Well, who knows? We know. We see <laughs> remnants of it all over the place. But officially, it was shut down in 1971. And coincidentally, or not coincidentally, and you can debate this, I'm not quite sure myself, in 1971, Richard Nixon started the War on Drugs. The War on Drugs. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a war that is not directed specifically at a foreign power. It is on a concept. It is apparently, ethnically, racially, completely impartial. We're not targeting anybody. But was it entirely a coincidence that in the same year they shut down COINTELPRO, they decided to open this war on drugs, which has now become a war on African Americans and people of color? And uh, without going into the great lengths, uh, how many people here have read The New Jim Crow? All right. 
And essentially, the premise of that book is that the war on drugs has become a new war against African Americans that has been fought in a way that systematically uh, targets them at every level of the criminal justice system to the point that they are now uh, overly represented in the prison population by some six times. Uh, and that this is, they are burdened by uh, probation and other things after their incarceration is over, it, it, uh, it slows advancement, it prevents them from getting ahead in society. It has become a major impediment to citizenship for African Americans. And I mention that because this war has gone on for some 40 years or more. And by some, depending on who you would be, but in the government, they might look at this and say, this was a great success, 40 years. Nobody's really objected to this thing. It's still going on. The way to go is with a war that is essentially, officially colorblind, but which allows us the freedom to control the people we want to control. And I mention that because the next thing up that I wanted to talk about was the war on terror after 9-11. And the war on 9-11, uh, the war on terror is, of course, another one of these wars that is not directed at it. It's colorblind. We don't even know who the terrorists are. There may be only a tiny number of them. In fact, we may not even be able to define what a terrorist is. And I would argue we can't. That any definition of what a terrorist is will almost automatically take in a large percentage of what we think of as free speech and, and dissent. Uh, nonetheless, we are now fighting a war on terror. And the question is, who actually is the enemy? Who are we naming? Because the power to name the enemy is the biggest thing that uh, a war, a domestic war, can do. And, and I think it's clear, initially, the Muslims were the, were the target of the war on terror. And uh, that is why uh, the FBI went after Yassin. He went after a lot of other uh, Muslims that we have locked up. Project Salam has documented some 800 cases uh, well, we are following some 800 cases, I should say, of uh, mostly Muslims who have been uh, preemptively prosecuted or had elements of preemptive prosecution in uh, the FBI's targeting of them. Uh, to show, that's just to show how, how large the problem is simply from a criminal justice system. If you add the immigration part of it into it, thousands, hundreds of thousands probably or more of immigrants have been targeted sent abroad, virtually no legal recourse whatsoever. So uh, the war on terror is both a war against uh, Muslims, people of color, and also the immigrant community. Um, there was two ways that the, the uh, government went after it. One was to criminalize certain things that most of us would, be, would consider to be beneficial, laudable. Things like peacemaking, uh, charity, Free speech, free association, social hospitality. Given the right circumstances, some connection with somebody that somebody said was a terrorist, this would be material support for terrorism, and you could be locked up for a very long period of time, literally. Uh, the terrorism enhancement, I think, quadruples the amount of time that a normal, if you were normally convicted of something, so if you got a six-year sentence, that would be a 24-year sentence. You know? um, another way that the FBI went after these people uh, was to create phony plots and then try to engage people in them. And that was, of course, the, what they did with Yassin uh, and uh, how they took him down. Uh, and it's interesting to note, uh, one of the questions that Kathy and I and, and others uh, in this movement have had for a long time is why would they go after somebody like Yassin? Why would they go after somebody like Samuel Arian, who is doing such a fine job down in Florida? Why would they go after any of these people? Because Objectively, none of them were doing any criminal work. They simply weren't. Um, and I, I actually have a wall. I brought it here, but I didn't see a good place to put it up, so I didn't. But almost every time I do one of these talks, I bring this wall of names, and it has 155 names on it. Uh, it's much too small to, to hold all the names of the cases we're following, but at 155, it's still pretty impressive. And when you look at all these cases, and you will say, in not, if you collectively stuck them all together, in not one of those cases was anybody killed. In not one of those cases was anybody injured. 
Nothing happened in any of those cases. And yet most of them are saving time in jail for maybe an average of 25, 30, 40 <laughs> up the life. So that was the kind of thing that they did. And then one of the questions we had was, why was Yassine, why was he targeted? And um, a few years ago, about a year ago actually, uh, we received, uh, we, we foiled the government to get their files on the case. And we received a file. And as, as typically is the case, uh, there was no information. It was all blacked out. <laughs> they redacted everything except the label. And the label said, Yassin Arab, AKA also known as Mohammed Yassin Al Qaeda. From that label, we could figure out that they believed that Yassin was an Al Qaeda agent named Mohammed Yassin who was using uh, an alias. We can also show that there was a man named Mohammed Yassin who was an Al Qaeda agent who was killed in Gaza in 2010. So it's perfectly clear that Yassin could not have been that person. And we now believe that the kind of tactics that the government used to lock him up were based entirely on misidentification. They simply had a piece of information, they thought it was right, it turned out it wasn't, but they don't care. As far as they're concerned, he is part of the enemy. Why should they go back and reverse an unjust conviction? And I will just give you quickly, to, just to show you how far uh, off they've gotten in this. Um, at the time we took our appeal, we filed a brief, and, and Kathy wrote the, the brief, and it was a brilliant brief, and it, it had a dozen points that in any normal case should have re resulted in a reversal. We filed our brief, the government filed their brief, then the government filed a secret brief that we were not allowed to see. Then the government filed a top secret brief that even the local prosecutor was not allowed to see. <laughs> Then we went down to court, we argued our case, and then we were excused, and the government went in and had a secret argument with the court. And when the decision came out, it was a, a brick. It's what I call a brick. It just had no, uh, it misrepresented our arguments, it mischaracterized them, and it just came up with phony excuses, literally, for getting rid of it. And now we understand why. We understand what they did. They went in, and they told the court, it doesn't matter that this case is nonsense, that there's no evidence that he did anything. He is an Al-Qaeda agent. Are you going to let him go? So the court was up to the court to find some reason to lock him up. So just recently, uh, we uh, made, made a motion to, uh, to vacate the judgment based on this discovery. And I wanted to just uh, reflect on that a little bit because what we had discovered uh, was this idea of this two parallel systems of justice. You have one, the war model, and one, the universal model. And it was clear that we are not going to be put in the universal model. We are clearly in the war model. That's where we are. In order to win in that kind of a model, you have to convince the courts, the judges, that you are not the enemy. And that is really a decision of the community. This cannot be shown by lawyers. These are not legal arguments. Only the community can say, we're not afraid of this guy. We believe he's, he's OK. We're more afraid of a government that would use secret information in court to lock people up. So one of the things that, uh, that we did, and I, I give Lynn a huge amount of credit for this, uh, Judge McAvoy's chambers were down in Binghamton. And uh, so she decided to walk a petition 1,700 signatures on the petition, down to Binghamton in order to show not only the breadth of the community feeling that this man was not a terrorist, but the depth of it. She walked 13 miles a day for 10 days. And it happened that she picked the time of day, the, uh, the time of the season when the heat advisories were out, and it was a brutal walk. But I have to say, from all down the, the Susquehanna Valley as we went down, there were people that came out from their houses and, and welcomed them. They, they brought her in and brought all of us actually into their houses for meals and for overnight. And just could not have been nicer. And one of them was Jack Gilroy. And, and uh, he showed up at Binghamton and gave a wonderful speech in front of the courthouse. Um, it was just a terrific community building exercise in which people could come out and express to the court how they felt about the kind of decision that was being made. Now, I'm going to quickly sort of skip ahead here. Um, it would be bad enough if that is what 
has happened to our legal system. In fact, recently it's become much, much worse, and I just want to quickly hop over some of these steps. One of the first things that happened was that uh, Dick Cheney wanted to bring back torture. Now, why? I think this is a great example of why you should never have a public official in high office with a mental case. I cannot <laughs> think of any other reason other than just pathology, why you would want to have, you know, what, go to sleep at night looking at um, videos of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed being waterboarded, but this is, right, this is what he wanted. And in order to achieve it, because it was clearly illegal, there is absolutely no question between treaties and, and law, this was an illegal idea. So he gets a young uh, person in the legal office, John Yu, and tells him to write an opinion that says it's okay to torture. So John Yu goes down to his office and he writes an opinion. Now, this is an incompetent opinion. It was bad law, he miscited things, he just made a hash of it. And, and I think, to John Yu's credit, because he's not, he's not a dumb, he did it because that was the only way you could do it. If you could not write a competent opinion that said that the, the torture was legal. But it didn't matter, because what they did was they classified it. Now, the only thing that people knew was that there was a legal opinion that said the torture was legal, but nobody could read it, and so they couldn't see that it was incompetent. And so that's how the whole thing got going. After Obama came in, the opinion was leaked. And you'll perhaps remember this, that the horror as the legal establishment saw this opinion that was completely incompetent, that made no sense at all. And they said, oh, no, no, John, you have to be disciplined. This is awful. He, you know, he did all sorts of bad things. And then something happened. And this is very typical of the Justice Department, I have to say. Whenever they, they don't turn over evidence or they do something else wrong and engage in misconduct, there's a, an initial huffing and puffing. And then nobody ever gets disciplined. Nobody ever gets this one. John Yu doesn't. He ends up as a professor at Stanford, and he's happy. Um, and so Obama comes in, and he says, oh, this is awful. We have to fix it. Torture. How do we fix it? We make it legal. And we classify it again. <laughs> so once more, we're back into this mode where all sorts of things are now legal again, so far as we know, but we don't know what they are. Um, and I want to just hold this up as a model for how the government works today, because they've picked up on, on the Korematsu case. They have picked up on the war on drugs. They understand now how it has to be done. It cannot be done overtly, openly. It has to be done secretly. It has to be done, and that's why Obama cracks down so hard on whistleblowers, because they are the greatest threat to his government. And Snowden I think, I hope, we'll bring it down, what do we will say? <laughs> um, the next, next one that came up, of course, was Guantanamo. Um, the next one, of course, was uh, indefinite detention and Guantanamo. I don't have to go over that. You understand those issues perfectly well. It's clearly against the rules of the Constitution to hold anybody indefinitely without charges. Uh, Guantanamo, of course, just does that. And not only does it do that, um, it, I think one of the things that really offends me about Guantanamo is the fact that about half the people we are presently holding there, indefinitely, without charges, are people that have been cleared for release. It is entirely beyond uh, legal understanding how you can justify holding people who have never been found guilty of anything and are not even in charge, and you agree they're innocent, and yet you continue to hold them under those horrible conditions. Enough said. The next one. Yeah, and, and, and counting. Um, the next thing, of course, was the presidential kill list. This is the one where the president, as chief of the armed forces, uh, has the right to decide who he wants to kill, even if it's an American citizen, even if it's not on a battlefield. And the great case, of course, that was um, uh, Alaki and his son, Abdul Rahman. Uh, they went after, shot uh, Alaki, the uh, imam, out in Yemen. He was an American citizen. He was actually a very popular American citizen and, and had been involved in a number of mosques here in, in America. And had just finally realized that, uh, in his opinion at least, uh, America had launched a war against Islam and it had to be resisted. And so that's what he was preaching. And uh, for that, he was blown up. But the tough one came later when 
the Obama went after two weeks later and blew up his 16-year-old son, Abdul Rahman. And he was at a cafe with some of his friends. There was no, no one had ever said that Abdul Rahman was engaged in terrorism, that he was doing anything wrong. There was absolutely no basis for this, other than now that his father had been blown up, he was about to go home and he was saying goodbye to his friend. The, the administration has prevaricated on this one. In the classic one, uh, the uh, press office announced that the real sin of Abdul Rahman was that he had a bad father. You can all remember that. Apparently later, people in the administration thought about it and said, you know, that's really not a good rationale. <laughs> So, a later rationale was that it was a signature strike. Whenever a group of young people get together in a foreign country somewhere, under circumstances which are secret, of course, we don't want to tell them what they might do to avoid it, uh, we can blow them up with a missile. That's fine. There's no problem with that, right? We don't need due process. And as famously as the White House announced, uh, what we do is we give them non-judicial due process. Now, this is absolute nonsense. This is crazy because the heart of due process is the idea of a neutral magistrate standing between the government and the person who's going to be punished and saying, show me your evidence, show me the law, show me where you are allowed to take this action that, that you want to take. That's the heart of due process. So to say, oh, there's no, it's non-judicial due process means I, I give the, hand the file to somebody in the White House who looks at it for a while and says, yeah, let's do it. Blow them up. They hold it. This is how our, our, legal, our legal machinery has been corrupted. Corrupted to the point that it no longer makes any sense. You cannot defend. I can't even explain it to people here as, as to what the government means. Um, the next thing after this was uh, the total information awareness. Uh, again, this violates uh, freedom of speech, uh, um, search and seizure. And there was a particularly exquisite moment, I think, there where uh, it was being leaked that the government was eavesdropping on all of our conversations, everybody. Now, you understand that for years, all of us knew that the Muslim community had been targeted, that virtually every conversation was being recorded, there were bugs in every mosque, and so on. American public didn't care. Hey, they're the enemy. You can do that to Muslims, right? Now, suddenly the Americans for the first time discovered that they were, everybody was getting, they're all being treated like Muslims. And they didn't like that. So there became a kind of a groundswell of, you know, maybe we don't want to be treated like that. Maybe that's a bad idea. And James Clapper went down to Congress and said, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Trust us. We just have a very targeted, tiny little, it's so narrow you can barely get through it. And very shortly afterwards, Snowden came out with his documents and showed conclusively that the government was lying. Clapper had committed perjury before Congress, and the whole thing was a gigantic lie. Now, to me, I didn't think this was a big deal because I knew this had been a lie for, for five years. I've been going, I've been writing articles about this. We all knew that this was a lie. But what Snowden did that was different was they made it provable. They issued documents that made it provable and in which the government cannot deny. It. Before they simply hadn't said anything and said, go ahead and prove it. Now they had to. That now they couldn't rest on that anymore. And so that became a way of sort of breaking open this whole idea of, of the government lying systematically to the American people about their own crimes. And of course, the government's response is saying, the real bad guys here are the people that expose the criminals in the government. They have to be hunted down. The people that are telling the truth to the American people about the criminals, they're the dangerous ones, not us. Um, so uh, the final injustice or indignity that I just want to mention, oh boy, I'm running out of time, uh, was the <clears throat> information laundering. This just came out in the last week, I guess. This is where the administration was still trying to hold on to the fig leaf that all of this massive collection of information was only to help uh, the war effort to identify terrorists. That's the only thing we're looking for. And once again, they were caught lying. Um, the information at least we, so far as we know, has been used to be passed to the Drug Enforcement Administration. 
in the war on drugs. Isn't that interesting? And that information is to be used to help track down and arrest mostly Afro-American uh, people who might be involved somehow in, in drug uh, events. But the danger for the administration was that they could not say that this information came from the National Security Administration, because that would be illegal, one more illegal act. So what they told the, the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration, or what the Drug Enforcement Administration was doing, was to simply do what they called parallel construction. They would explain how their investigations all started from perfectly legitimate sources, even though it was a lie. They would not acknowledge that they started from TSA, uh, NSA uh, secret material. So what they've discovered is that a lot, if not all, of the major drug cases have all been based on, on perjury, on false documents, on false information. And of course, the question everybody in Washington is asking is, what other agency gets this? <laughs> what other agency gets this? And by the way, if you get information that shows that one of your senators is on the take, or is sleeping with somebody you shouldn't be sleeping with, what do you do with that information when he wants to vote down your budget? How many public officials can you blackmail with that kind of information? So what I'm painting here is a very depressing picture. And Kathy will tell me, she told me when I, I gave her a preview of this, this is the most depressing thing I've ever seen. You know? our, our government is completely corrupted. And it is uh, impossible, really, I think, as lawyers to say with any certainty that we can work within this system. Uh, we have to try. We are lawyers, and we have to try. And sometimes you get results. But basically, there comes a time for all lawyers and for everybody to say, if the system is so broke that you cannot work within it, you have to step out. You cannot legitimize a broken system. And so that is the debate that I'm, I see more and more within the legal community, recognizing that even with our best efforts and the best arguments on the law, we are not going to prevail in cases that have been tainted by war. And essentially, more and more of the cases that we are seeing now in court are tainted by war as the government more and more sees all Americans as the enemy. All Americans are the enemy because they can disagree with the people that want to get the power. And if you disagree with them, that's material support for terrorism. So that's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm looking at in terms of how war affects the law. Um, and I just wanted to end on a positive note, but I think what I'll do is I'll just stop right there. And, uh, <laughs> hey, we're going to have a plenary session. No, no, no. We're going to play, and, and we're going to talk about what we can do there, and I'm going to try to roll that part of it over. So, I'll leave it.